Chapter 15 Consecration and Investiture Leviticus 8, 14-36 And he brought the bullock for the sin offering, and Aaron his sons laid their hands upon the head of the bullock for the sin offering. And he slew it, and Moses took the blood and put it upon the horns of the altar round about with his finger, and purified the altar, and poured the bloods at the bottom of the altar, and sanctified it to make reconciliation upon it. And he took all the fat that was upon the innards, and the caul above the liver, and the two kidneys and their fats, and Moses burned it upon the altar. But the bullock, and his hide, his flesh, and his dung, he burnt with fire without the camp, as the Lord commanded Moses. And he brought the ram for the burnt offering, and Aaron and his sons laid their hands upon the head of the ram. And he killed it, and Moses sprinkled the blood upon the altar round about. And he cut the ram into pieces, and Moses burnt the head and the pieces and the fat. And he washed the inwards and the legs in water, and Moses burnt the whole ram upon the altar. It was a burnt sacrifice for a sweet savour, and an offering made by fire unto the Lord, as the Lord commanded Moses. And he brought the other ram, the ram of consecration, and Aaron and his sons laid their hands upon the head of the ram. And he slew it, and Moses took of the blood of it, and put it upon the tip of Aaron's right ear, and upon the thumb of his right hand, and upon the great toe of his right foot. And he brought Aaron's sons, and Moses put of the blood upon the tip of their right ear, and upon the thumb of their right hands, and upon the great toes of their right feet. And Moses sprinkled the blood upon the altar round about. And he took the fats, and the rump, and all the fat that was upon the innards, and the caul above the liver, and the two kidneys, and their fat, and the right shoulder. And out of the basket of unleavened bread that was before the Lord, he took one unleavened cake, and a cake of oiled bread, and one wafer, and put them on the fats and upon the right shoulder. And he put all upon Aaron's hands and upon his son's hands, and waved them for a wave offering before the Lord. And Moses took them from off their hands, and burnt them on the altar upon the burnt offering. They were consecrations for a sweet savour. It is an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And Moses took the breast and waved it for a wave offering before the Lord. For of the ram of consecration it was Moses' part, as the Lord commanded Moses. And Moses took of the anointing oil and of the blood which was upon the altar, and sprinkled it upon Aaron and upon his garments, and upon his sons, and upon his sons' garments with him, and sanctified Aaron and his garments, and his sons, and his sons' garments with him. And Moses said unto Aaron and to his sons, Boil the flesh at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and there eat it with the bread that is in the basket of consecrations, as I commanded, saying, Aaron and his son shall eat it. And that which remaineth of the flesh and of the bread shall ye burn with fire. And ye shall not go out of the door of the tabernacle of the congregation in seven days, until the days of your consecration be at an end, for seven days shall he consecrate you. As he hath done this day, so the Lord hath commanded to do, to make an atonement for you. Therefore shall ye abide at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, day and night seven days, and keep the charge of the Lord, that ye die not, for so I am commanded. So Aaron and his sons did all things which the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses. Leviticus 8, 14-36 in this chapter, as in chapters 9 and 10, we have an historical account, which, with Leviticus 24, 10 to 23, is the only historical data in Leviticus. Chapter 8 is concerned with the consecration and investiture of Aaron and his sons. The consecration sacrifices are, first, a sin offering, verses 14 to 17. The purpose of this sacrifice is purification. Second, there is the burnt offering, Verses 18-21 to 21 for dedication. Third, there is a consecration offering. Verses 22-23, to 23, which was a peace offering. Verse 31, to set forth communion. Oil and blood are used together in this instance. 
not separately, and the garments or vesture are included. All this is done, we are told, as the Lord commanded Moses, a recurring phrase, 738, 8, 3 to 4 and 9, 13, 17, 21, 29, 34, 36, 9, 6 and 7, 10, 21, 10, 7 and 13 and 15. The text gives us what God requires in meticulous detail so that in all things God is meticulously obeyed. This is done to stress the necessity of precise obedience. As R.K. Harrison noted, Obedience is at the heart of both the Old and the New Covenants, and this, rather than love, is God's prime demand of his followers. The Christian is urged to bring every thought to the obedience of Christ, 2 Corinthians 10.5, and to see obedience as one mark of a sanctified personality, 1 Peter 1.2. Samuel Clark rightly and perceptively noted that, because the rites of consecration lasted a week, They were connected with the sabbatical number of the covenant. This means that, even as the Sabbath means rest for us, rest in the Lord, so the true priesthood means rest for a people. In Judges 3.11, 30, 5.31 and 7, 6 and 8, while the word used for rest is not the same as Sabbath, Shabbaton, rest, but is Shagot, still we are told that the land had rest when the people were godly, In Leviticus 8, the meaning of a week given to the consecration of Aaron and his sons means that the peace and rest of the covenant people is tied to their faithfulness. Paul tells us of Christ that He is our peace, Ephesians 2.14, having abolished the judgment against us and having made us to be reconciled with God. We have already, chapter 14, cited Exodus 29.42-46. God there declares the purpose of his sanctuary. First, he will there meet with his people. Second, God's glory will sanctify the sanctuary, as well as the priests thereof. Third, God declares that he will dwell among his people to be their God, and they shall know that I am the Lord their God. Clearly, we are told that the sanctuary, or the church, is not as other buildings. It is set apart for a sacred purpose and any profanation of it is a serious offence. If the Bible means what it says, God requires beauty and glory in all houses of worship dedicated to him. He tells Haggai centuries later that for the people to live in lovely houses while his house lies waste is offensive to him. Haggai 1.4 Again, God's people are holy and set apart for his purposes. How serious this is to God appears in Paul's comment to the Corinthians, namely that even the unbelieving spouse of a Christian is sanctified or separated and to a degree protected by God, and this applies also to the children, 1 Corinthians 7.14. Too often Christians are unwilling to face up to the implications of this verse because they view things in terms of a person's faith and works, whereas God sees the unbelieving spouse in terms of his covenant grace and mercy. If we give priority to what man is, we forget what God is. Now we come to the heart of this chapter, the consecration and investiture of the priests. We must remember that this is an historical account. As history, we must also remember that it comes after the giving of the law and after the incident of Exodus 32 the creation and worship of the golden bull calf. As Wenham noted, Aaron was not the instigator of this idea, but a very willing accessory. It was Moses' intercession that saved Israel and Aaron from God's wrath. Now this same Aaron is made high priest and sanctified. A very precise and long ceremony marks this consecration and investiture with the office of high priest. What does it mean to sanctify Aaron? Does this ceremony make him a better man? What does it mean today to ordain a clergyman, to consecrate and invest him with a pastoral task? First, as we have already seen in Leviticus 4, for example, the greater the calling, the greater the responsibility, 
and the culpability. Our Lord says, For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required, and to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. Luke 12, 48. Thus, clearly, because a priest was given a high responsibility, he was also held liable to more judgment. This is true also of churches. 1 Peter 4.17 makes it clear that judgments must begin at the house of God. Similarly, favoured and covenanted nations also bear the brunt of God's judgments if they are faithless, as was true of Israel and many peoples in the Christian era. Second, greater responsibility and culpability is also accompanied by greater grace. Aaron was hardly deserving of his position. His later history makes it clear that he had his share of weaknesses. His hostility to Moses' marriage to an Ethiopian woman, Numbers 12, 1-15, makes clear his weakness, because he was a willing tool for his sister Miriam. Thus, consecration and investiture do not give a man exemption from human frailties, but they do give him more grace and more judgment, depending on the tenor of his life. The greater the responsibility, the greater is the grace and power given when we look to our God for it. Our Lord requires this dependence on grace, declaring to all his servants, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues. And ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thoughts how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. Matthew ten, sixteen to 20 Note here that our Lord gives very practical counsel. Because they face their enemies truly unarmed, they must use wisdom. They must beware of men. This does not mean fearing them, but it does call for the exercise of good sense. They will face brutal men and beatings. However, in this context, special grace will be given. Take no thought does not mean to be unprepared and ignorant, but rather not to be anxious or fearful about their testimony when on trial. Grace shall then be given, and the Holy Spirit shall speak in and through them. Third, as Lange wrote, the Levitical priesthood was a type of Christ. Emphasis is everywhere placed upon the fact that they were appointed of God, compare Hebrews 5.4. They were in no sense appointed by the people. Had they been so, they could not have been mediators. All was from God. The Levitical priest could be but a type of that seed of the woman who should bruise the serpent's head. Lange held that the Christian ministry finds its analogy not in the priests, but in the prophets of the old dispensation, although even here the likeness is imperfect. The early church saw itself as a Levitical ministry. The prophets, even more than the priests, had special endowments or grace, so that Lange's point requires, as he implied, a full separation of God's ministry from one age to another, from the Hebraic covenant to the Christian covenant. The New Testament gives evidence of a continuing endowment of grace, apart from the gifts of the Spirit, Paul's letter to Timothy make it clear that Timothy needs instruction and guidance. At the same time, Paul says, Stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. 2 Timothy 1, 6 and 7 Very plainly, the laying on of hands carried with it certain gifts of grace, and the three which are specified are power, love, and a sound mind. At the same time, it is clear from Paul's many instructions and warnings that these gifts of grace can be neglected, forgotten, despised, or forsaken. Timothy is ordered to stir up or rekindle God's gift. It is a fire which neglect can reduce. 
Mikhail and Delich commented, This investiture, regarded as the putting on of an important official dress, was a symbol of his endowment with the character required for the discharge of the duties of his office, the official costume being the outward sign of installation in the office which he was to fill. The endowment is an act of grace and is grace, and yet it is not a grace which is automatic and concomitant with the ordained man's every act. Paul refers to this consecration and summons all believers as members of Christ's body, Romans 12, 3-5, to to do the same with their own lives. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Romans 12, 1 and 2 Pagan priesthood had an inherent, autonomous power. Thus the priesthood of Egypt, which culminated in the monarch, a priest-king with absolute power, was emphatically unlike the biblical priesthood. Egypt had no law code because the divine priest-king could not be under law since his word was the sufficient law. God's priests, apostles and pastors are under God's revealed law as given in his word. The sin offering makes this fact clear. Priesthood commences by self-abnegation, the confession of sin and renunciation of personal merit. This renunciation of personal merit must be accompanied by a strict obedience to God's every word, Matthew 4.4. 4. And what was to be the results of this strict adherence to the word of God? A truly blessed result indeed. The glory of the Lord shall appear unto you. Fourth, because all God's people are called to be his servant priests, we are all, when we give ourselves to his service with all our heart, mind and being, consecrated and invested by his grace to do his work, His grace summons us, and then His grace invests us. In the ritual of purification, Aaron's right big toe was smeared with blood, also his thumb and his right ear, verse 24. His ear was first consecrated to listen always to God's word. His hands were consecrated next, the part standing for the whole, the right hand's thumb for both hands to do God's work, and his feet to walk always in the way of holiness. Psalm 119 is a reflection on this holy duty. The psalmist declares, among other things, Order my steps in thy word, and let not any iniquity have dominion over me. Thou art near, O Lord, and all thy commandments are truth. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. It should be noted that in Leviticus 8, 10 and 11 the house of worship is also anointed with all its furnishings. Again, it must be recognised that this is ordered by God. In our day men are casual about God's house and its furnishings. To many see more than the barest expenditures here as wasteful, and yet these same people are often particular about attractive clothing for themselves and desirable housing. When a woman poured ointment of spikenard over our Lord's head, some of the disciples were indignant, saying, Why was this waste of the ointment made? For it might have been sold for more than three hundred pence and have been given to the poor. And they murmured against her. Mark 14, 4 and 5 Our Lord, however, rebuked the disciples and commended the woman. The description of the requirements for the tabernacle stress, beauty and costly construction. The very garments of Aaron are declared not only to be holy, but also to be for glory and for beauty, Exodus 28, 2 and 40. To assume that God wanted this to impress Israel because they were a childlike people is a childish opinion and insulting to God. His honour requires the first fruits of our lives, abilities and concerns. There is nothing childlike or primitive in a requirement of excellence in the physical and moral spheres, in a requirement of excellence of men and of what men build for Christ's work and kingdom. Psalm 